So we're in the midst of exploring many of the gifts with which God equips his people, what they are, how they come to us, what they're used for, and what you can do to develop them and how to use them most effectively. Will you pray with me? Father, in this moment, we thank you for your presence, and we thank you, God, for the way that you work, whether we are physically together or virtually. God, I believe you are among us right now. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. Teach us your life-giving truths. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've missed the first two talks in this series, because the amount of information is significant and not easily summarized, I heartily encourage you to read, listen, or watch them on the website. This particular QR code will take you there. You can just snap a picture of it and use it later at your leisure, but this will take you directly to the sermon library. The first segment of our series together examined three lists of gifts given by God to his people. And I categorize them like this. Motivational gifts from God the Father, which are found in Romans 12. The leadership gifts from God the Son, which are found in Ephesians 4. And the demonstration gifts of God from the Holy Spirit uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, these lists are probably not exhaustive, but they do provide a clear sense of the types of gifts in each category and their common purposes. And with that information as a background, we turn to considering why God has given us gifts at all. And the one aim that all of his gifts have in common is to build up the church, God's redeemed people. That's what he wants to do, and that's what all the gifts serve, is to build up his people spiritually. He's preparing a forever bride that's suited to his eternal son. God's gifts provide us with the motivations, the guidance, and the power to develop or mature spiritually, both individually and also collectively. We grow together in the love and unity of Christ. I identified three areas in a lifetime of spiritual development, and they are identity, trust, and passion. Our Christian identity, developing an active trust in the Lord, and a godly passion for his purposes. Can I just say, without a proper sense of one's Christian identity, the uncertainties of life will throw you off course or sideline you altogether. Identity provides assurance and resilience in the life of a Christian so that you can keep moving forward. Identity is built by the Father's motivational gifts. Without a vital active trust in the Lord, pride will take over through self-will and self-protection, turning even our good deeds into negative forces. Trust supports humility and perseverance for our Christian journey. If you want to make it to the end, you have to learn to trust the Lord. And trust is built by the Son's leadership gifts. We're going to see how this works in just a few minutes. Without godly passions, worldly passions will naturally take over and rule us. And we'll live by our feelings instead of by our faith. Godly passion is the fuel of the Christian life that draws us toward God and His will for our lives. Godly passion is built as the Spirit's supernatural gifts promote the love of Christ in our hearts and unity in the body of Christ. More about that later today. Last weekend, I introduced the first of these three elements, identity. There are many factors that contribute to our natural sense of identity, but only Christ can give us a truly spiritual Christian identity. The motivational gifts from the Father have everything to do with finding and fulfilling your identity in Christ. So I urge you to reflect on that as you read through the passage in Romans chapter 12. Your identity in Christ cannot and should not replace your natural identity. 
which Christ has redeemed. He formed you in love. He redeemed you in power. And he loves you just the way you came to him. So instead, you're going to wear your Christian identity like you would put on a coat, like you would put on a garment of new righteousness, never to be removed again. Christian identity clothes you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Identification with Christ is how we connect our hearts with His. So as you learn to embrace your new identity in Christ, the Holy Spirit also develops trust in the Savior. And this is the second area of spiritual development. Now, I think it's safe to say that everyone has some kind of faith. However, faith is only as good or valuable as its object. So if you trust in a chair with a broken leg, what's likely to happen? If you depend on a car with a clogged fuel line, how far do you think you'll get? And if you believe in a lie, where will that take you? So what do we do with our natural faith? What do we naturally trust in? I think we trust in what we feel. I think we trust in what we've been told. I think we trust in what we've experienced, whether good or bad. And I think we trust in what we've studied. But I read in the scripture that the heart is deceitful. God said through Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, meaning unhealthy and weak. Who can understand it? So if we do as the world suggests and just follow your heart, it's not necessarily going to lead you down a good path. If you depend on your feelings, inevitably, you will be led astray because our feelings are unreliable. They rise, they fall. You can't predict how you're going to feel when you wake up tomorrow, no matter how you felt when you closed your eyes last night. Our feelings are real, but they're not necessarily true in the sense of truth. It's a true feeling, but it's not necessarily the truth about you, or even about your circumstances, or about other people. And your feelings don't necessarily lead you to truth. And not only our feelings, but our knowledge. Our knowledge is severely limited. Even the knowledge that's the result of our personal experience. Paul wrote these words, 1 Corinthians 13. He said, now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. You know what you know but we seldom know how much we don't know. How could we? And we seldom know perspectives other than our own. The scriptures remind us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Is that what it says? It's impossible to please God. And Jesus himself said, all things are possible for the one who trusts. And yet the Bible says, not everyone is a believer. Not everyone does trust. Not everyone trusts in Jesus Christ. The entire sentence is this. Pray, too, that we will be rescued from the wicked and evil people, for not everyone is a believer. In other words, not everyone shares your confidence in Jesus Christ. Some people are indifferent to him. They just don't care. While others are actually opposed to him and to the gospel message that he brought. They think everyone would be better off as an unbeliever. In another place, Paul wrote, God has given to everyone the measure of faith. But the context of that verse makes it clear that he was thinking of a particular kind of faith. He's not saying that every human being on the planet has faith. That would contradict the verse I read just a moment ago. What he is saying as he writes to the church in Rome, to the believers in the great city of Rome, he's saying that every one of you has faith. You have a particular kind of faith. 
you have a faith in Jesus. And when he said everyone, the original language makes clear that he meant every one of you, referring to those believers in that great city to whom he addressed his letter. So it is through the leadership gifts of the Son of God, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teaching pastors, that God prompts and guides the daily practice and development of our personal trust in Jesus. We don't even need to try to have enough challenges to our trust. They come when we don't ask for them, don't they? We have ample opportunity to practice our trust, and it's the words of apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teaching pastors that remind us and encourage us and enable us to trust in Jesus. When God calls us to himself, he invites us first to trust in him. And so we begin to believe in him. And then God shows us Jesus' faithfulness, his compassion, his authentic love, his selfless sacrifice, his substitutionary death, and then his miraculous resurrection. He reveals the Son of God in human form, and he invites us not just to believe that he exists, but to trust him, to trust who he is, to trust him for forgiveness from all our sins, to trust him for our right standing with the Father, our welcome into his presence, to trust him for everlasting salvation, to trust him to be with us in every circumstance, to trust him to fight for us in every battle we face, to trust him to never let us go even when we let him go, to trust him to order our steps, to provide our needs, and to secure our victory, to trust him to transform us into his likeness and to be gracious to us at every point of that lifelong process. Christians are who they are, followers of Christ, because they trust in him. Identification with Christ is how we connect our hearts with him, and trust is how we show others that we identify with him. As we follow Jesus, our identity with him becomes clarified and our trust in him deepens. To be mature, there's a third area in which we must develop spiritually, and that is our passion. This is more than the natural passion of youth because this is a passion that has been tested. How many of you like tests? I don't see any hands. Nobody's raising their hands to say they like to be examined. But how many of you know from time to time we need it? And from time to time they help us. And they show us what we've learned, what we've achieved, and what we yet lack. The kind of passion I'm talking about is more than the natural passion of youth. This is a passion that has been tested and tried. In the crucible of life, it's been consumed by the heat until it was gone. And then by the life of the Holy Spirit, it is resurrected to flourish again. If you haven't had a dream or a vision or a promise from God that has died a natural death, then you don't know yet this passion because it flows from a well that has to be dug in the heat of the day. This passion can only be gained by wrestling with God through a dark night of your soul. It's precisely the struggle to trust and to hope and to love without assurance, without a sign, without reward that births this passion. It's written concerning Jesus that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence 
to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews chapter 4. Of all the temptations that Jesus overcame, none are directly mentioned except one. His struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night he was betrayed and arrested. He confided on that night to his closest disciples, my soul is deeply grieved, even to the point of death. And he asked them to pray with him, to support him with their prayers. He himself prayed earnestly three times. He said, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. I want your will to be done, not mine. It was the closest that Jesus ever came to caving in to the pressure. As he wrestled in prayer, the writer says he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Thud, thud, thud. But he rose from that struggle. He got off his knees victorious. He stood up empowered. He said, let us go. I am he. This, my friends, depicts the great difference between the fully human Jesus and the rest of us. He never caved. This passion is so much more than the excitement that's stirred by our initial discovery that Christ is real and his love is true and his forgiveness is so great. First love is a marker to be remembered. It's a starting over place when we've lost our way. But love is meant to grow. We're not intended to always live in first love. Our love is to be seasoned and matured because nothing compares with that kind of love. A seasoned and mature love is a love that has become surrendered and devoted. The Apostle Paul wrote these words. Three things, he said, will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Faith, hope, and love on fire describes this Passion. This passion I'm referring to is the persistent enthusiasm of a heart that is surrendered to the love of Christ and full of the Holy Spirit and joyously embracing opportunities to serve for His name's sake. Passion is devotion. It's love that is focused. It's knowledge that is wise. It's service that is empowered, and it is faith that won't quit. These are the fruit of the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. The supernatural gifts from the Spirit of God demonstrate the impassioned character of our King, Jesus Christ. They build up the church until it becomes a united, functioning body of believers where Christian love prevails and truth is proclaimed and sinners are convicted and the broken are healed. We need to grow in these ways. You and I need to grow in these ways by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to give ourselves to Him so completely that He can trust us not to become proud, 
nor self-centered, nor abusive with his gift until he can use us supernaturally. Identification with Christ is how we connect our hearts with his. Trust is how we show others that we identify with him. And passion empowers the revelation of God's kingdom. These three overlap and strengthen each other, maturing each believer and thus maturing the whole church until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's God's design. That's his plan for his people. So far, we've explored three types of gifts from God. And we've underscored the primary purpose of all of them, to build up the church in its identity with Christ and in its passion for the work of God. Next Sunday, we're going to learn how to use these gifts effectively. But for now, that's where we're going to stop. So aren't you glad you came today? Hallelujah. So glad. Well, let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your loving kindness. You've given us a brand new identity covering and superseding all that we have become through our growing up years. Some of our experiences have helped us to become good people. Some of our experiences have not. But you've redeemed all of those. And by the power of your grace, made everything contribute to who you want us to become in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for our new identity in him. Thank you for helping us to trust him more than we trust ourselves, more than we trust our feelings, more than we trust our thoughts. God, continue to lead us in this direction until we just shake our heads at the feelings and the thoughts that oppose him and say, it is written, and go that way. We thank you today that the Holy Spirit is building a fire of godly passion in us. And today, God, we're simply offering ourselves to you afresh. To say, not, not what the world says about me, not even what I say about myself, but what you say about me, who you say I am. Become the I am in which I live. Give me your identity. Let me wear it as an outer garment for the rest of my days. Build in me a confidence in you when I lack confidence in others or myself. Help me to trust Jesus Christ before I turn what people can provide or even what I think I can 
do for myself. So that what I do is empowered by my trust in you. Build this trust in you. Grow this confidence. Become my all in all. With me in every situation. And I pray, God, ignite a fire in me. Release the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit in your body, in the church, and in my life. To set on fire our hearts for your service. The things that you offer us and the things that you ask of us we can't do them in our own strength. We don't have sufficient wisdom, knowledge, or understanding. We need you. We need you. We need your power. So order our steps and fuel us with the fire of God. And show us how to walk in our gifts for your glory and our good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.